Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, on our webinar today. We are excited to be joined by Dr. Ryan Fields, who is the Chief of Surgical Oncology at Washington University School of Medicine and the Alvin J. Seitman Cancer Center. He is a translational surgeon scientist that is the principal investigator for the Patient Engagement and Cancer Genomic Sequencing, or PECGS, Cancer Moonshot Program at the Washington University School of Medicine. I'm Melinda Bikini, the Director of Patient Services with the Calangiocarcinoma Foundation, and Dr. Fields is going to give a presentation, and we will open it up for uh, questions and answers at the end of the presentation, so feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Fields, for joining us. I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much for having me and, and for your partnership and um, all the work that we um, have done and are trying to do would, would not be possible. It's just easy to say it would not be possible without the partnership of the Calangiocarcinoma Foundation. And I'll explain why and, and where a lot of this work came from and where it's going. Um, so I'm going to um, go through some slides uh, for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll have a chance for uh, some uh, hopefully good discussion. So uh, Melinda, is that projecting okay for you guys seeing the slides? Yes, it all looks good. Great. Um, so the title of this um, um, project is a bit of a, a mouthful, um, the, the Participant Engagement and Cancer Genome Sequencing or PECGS program, and that came from the National Cancer Institute. And I'll, I'll take uh, go through a little bit of background about where the program came from and how it integrates with the cancer moonshot, and then what we're trying to do specifically in cholangiocarcinoma. Um, and I'm presenting this really, as I indicated in the bottom there, on behalf of a, a, a large group of investigators at, at my cancer center uh, and a partnership with the cholangiocarcinoma foundation and other patient advocacy groups. So no disclosures or anything uh, relevant to this discussion that uh, I need to mention. So let's go back in time to 2015. Many uh, will probably remember when then President Obama uh, announced the cancer moonshot initially. Uh, he did this during his State of the Union address in October of 2015. And as he was announcing it, he turned and uh, told then Vice President Joe Biden, Joe, you're going to be in charge of this. As many know, uh, 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 Joe Biden's uh, son, Bo, died of a, a brain tumor, so he was very engaged in this process. And the cancer moonshot uh, analogy was uh, uh, tied into President Kennedy's challenge to, to put a person on the moon um, with the cancer moonshot being charged to make uh, big progress, big inroads in cancer uh, in many aspects um, uh, by 2020. Uh, and, and then uh, really with other goals, uh, really to cut the cancer death rate in half by 2040. So of course, the first thing that they did when they announced it with this billion dollar investment was what are we, what are we gonna do with all the money? So um, uh, then Vice President Biden uh, put together what he, they termed a blue ribbon panel of cancer experts. These were people across the spectrum of basic cancer research, translational cancer research, clinical trials, disparities, to really come up with uh, key initiatives. So this is a screenshot from the cancer.gov cancer moonshot uh, webpage. You can uh, see this um, uh, uh, yourself, and if you sort of, it, it's it's pretty um, easy to navigate through. And if you look on the left-hand column, when you were to look through here, what the research initiatives are, there are a number of different research initiatives shown in blue here. And these were what the blue ribbon panel said. Here's how we need to come up. Uh, here's here are key priority areas where there's either a gap or an unmet need that we should prioritize this money. And one of those was to establish a network for direct patient engagement. And the idea for this was, and the gap was, um, uh, the NCI recognized that they really needed to engage patients to contribute their tumor profile data, their tumor sequencing, to expand knowledge about ther what therapies work, in whom, and in which types of cancer. The gap there was uh, predominantly related to the observation that I think we all appreciate now more than ever, and that a lot of the studies done in, in a lot of solid tumors, including cholangiocarcinoma, were very heterogeneous. They really uh, had overrepresentation of patients of a particular age, of a particular demographic, whether that was male, female, white, black, um, um, patients that had had uh, from particular geographic areas. And so we were making pretty broad conclusions on how patients responded to treatments based on uh, data that wasn't necessarily representative in, in those patient populations. So part of it was to overcome that gap. 
Part of it was to st study rare, uh, more understudied cancers like cholangiocarcinoma and to engage patients directly in this to try to understand why patients participate or don't participate in these types of studies. This is a little bit more detail about this uh, uh, particular initiative in terms of the uh, uh, establishing a direct network for patient engagement. And when this came out, we initially uh, very quickly realized that cholangiocarcinoma could be not only a great tumor to study because of all these reasons, but that the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation and the work that you all have done with your Mutations Matter campaign and the mutations that are relevant in cholangiocarcinoma could be a perfect partnership here. So the um, research network that was formed, and again, the NCI came uh, up with this uh, mouthful of a topic was this participant engagement in cancer genome sequencing network. Um, this was to uh, support what I had mentioned, the direct engagement of cancer patients as participants in their cancer research. So they didn't want, you know, just Dr. Fields and Dr. Smith and Dr. whoever to put together a proposal that said, we're gonna study all these specimens. They wanted patients and their caregivers, what we term participants, so patients and their caregivers, their support network to really be involved in the research program to try to not only better frame the questions, but better ask the questions and then figure out if our methodologies were, were working from the patient and caregiver perspective. I'll give you an example. When we had, uh, uh, when we were at the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation annual conference, and uh, Melinda and others gave us a form, and we talked with patients. We didn't really recognize how important the timing of when we might approach a patient for participation would be, but a lot of the patients and caregivers and participants did, and gave us a lot of good advice on on timing of approaching uh, 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 participants for this type of study. Um, these research centers are going to use different approaches to promote cancer genome sequencing programs that would address important knowledge gaps in the genomic characterization of tumors. The network uh, was specifically interested in using direct participant engagement to advance the understanding of rare cancers, highly lethal cancers, cancers with early age of onset, cancers with high disparities, and cancers that are prevalent in understudied populations. And really, cholangiocarcinoma hits uh, the majority, if not all, of these factors that the NCI was interested in studying. Um, and so this was the, uh, an overview of, of what we proposed at, at WashU and what was ultimately funded. So we're studying three cancer types that uh, kind of fit the bill, cholangiocarcinoma being one of them, also studying colorectal cancer in Black patients under the age of 50, and multiple myeloma in Black patients. Not totally relevant, of course, to this group, but uh, uh, I mentioned it to show you the other cancers we're um, uh, studying and why. And then what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do a lot of really cutting edge genomic and, and transcriptomic and other characterization that I'll mention at sort of a 30,000 foot view. This is beyond the standard sequencing that you might have as part of your standard of care, but we would integrate that standard of care testing into the analysis. And then we're going to directly engage the participants and the patients in translating these results and providing these results back to patients and their caregivers. And we're going to study how what the impact of that is. So is it helpful, of course, from a, a treatment standpoint, but is it helpful in, 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 in a better understanding of your own uh, 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 tumor or cancer? Is it uh, uh, provided in a way that feels like there's some level of, of satisfaction and contribution to the field as a whole, but also personally. And when we uh, uh, do things like informed consent and discuss the study, when we then return results, is it done as, in a way that is number one, easily understandable and, and optimized? Is it, it done in a way that's efficient? Is it done in a way that from the patient and the caregiver perspective would encourage further result uh, further participation in clinical trials and clinical studies and in clinical research. Uh, uh, as many know, Melinda has done a lot of work in this space of, of really understanding from the patient perspective how and why uh, patients and participants uh, 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 participate so generously in research. What are the perceived benefits? What are the perceived risks? What's the threshold for participation? Um, and, and, and that work is something that we um, uh, would certainly look for to leverage in this partnership. And then once that happens, you can think of this as a, as a continuous cycle of we, we, we try something, we engage patients and participants, but then shown in green, we try to optimize that so that we're 
we refine our techniques. Uh, and really the goal would be to define some best practices here that in the future could be used not only for cholangiocarcinoma, but any study that involved cancer genomics uh, and, and clinical research to really try to, again, encourage broad participation that's representative of, of the spectrum of the population that that disease affects. A lot of people are familiar with the fact that cholangiocarcinoma is a, 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 a tumor that has a, a fair number of mutations. It has druggable mutations that are targetable, um, including uh, a lot of what people know are, are going on right now in the IDH1 space and, and other targeted therapies and also in immune therapy. And as many know, cholangiocarcinoma is still considered, shown on the uh, left side, kind of at the bottom of those blue bars, uh, a relatively rare cancer compared to other types. So again, it, it really fits the bill here. As I mentioned at the outset, I'm really presenting this on behalf of a large group of, uh, uh, of a team of about 30 investigators, but the other principal investigators, uh, uh, there are four of us, include Graham Kolditz, who's the director of our Division of Public Health Sciences and a public health and Impl implementation science expert here at Washington University, Bettina Drake, who's an expert in cancer disparities in public health, also here at Washington University, and then Lee Ding, who is the head of uh, our Genome Institute and a world leader in cancer genomics. So again, each of us will lead one of these three units, our participant engagement unit that will um, uh, coordinate uh, consenting patients and involving patients into this study. We'll then work on the logistics of obtaining medical records and specimens and get those here into WashU. The Blue Genome Sequencing uh, Center led by Dr. Ding will then Bring all, uh, do all of the uh, what I call hardcore science that's going to look deeply into the tumors. And then that will all go back to the patients and with the EOU or the Engagement Optimization Unit led by Dr. Drake and Dr. Kolditz, will then uh, through a lot of survey work and focus groups really try to improve and evaluate our recruitment and attention uh, of participants, assess the relevance of the assays performed, improve the return of results, really again, seeing how we're doing in this. As I also mentioned early on, we couldn't do this without um, our patient advocacy group partners, including the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation, because uh, all of these tumors and the subsets we're studying are either uncommon or rare, but we also want to engage patients from across the country, not just here in St. Louis. So we're working with uh, uh, Fight Colorectal Cancer as well and the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation in parallel to try to do the same, uh, uh, have the same sort of impact. So that will include help in reporting results, in refining our protocols, in uh, having a number of, uh, of overview sessions to uh, look at this as a big picture to recruit patients and participants. We wouldn't be able to do this on our own at all to, again, improve and iteratively uh, uh, both develop and refine our, our methodologies. These uh, um, units, as shown on the, on the right, will also integrate with some other larger cancer and uh, NIH initiatives, this includes the National Cancer Institute's uh, larger uh, genomic sequencing efforts, the NIH's All of Us program, which is not a cancer specific uh, program, but a program related to trying to integrate genomic sequencing with health records across the spectrum of human disease. And then of course, returning the results and reports that we develop directly to participants and their caregivers and their physicians. We hope to enroll several, several hundred patients per year across the five years of the study. And that includes uh, including, uh, uh, a large number, several hundred patients from the get-go that would be retrospective patients. So these can be patients diagnosed previously with cholangiocarcinoma uh, and these other cancer types where we can go back and, and retrieve previous surgical specimens or biopsies for analysis contact the patients and their caregivers to do some of the survey work and gather medical records, but it'll be done over the course of this five-year grant. And then what we'll actually be doing, which is uh, um, um, some uh, pretty cutting edge and in-depth uh, work, uh, the sequencing that we will do will involve some of the standard whole exome and genome sequencing, but really we will get down into doing single cell work, the most cutting edge uh, uh, sequencing you can do right now that looks at DNA and RNA and the epigenome from individual uh, cells within a specimen. So we understand the changes of the tumor cells 
how different those are amongst the tumor, what we call heterogeneity or differences in the tumor. And then importantly, what the non-tumor cells of the tumor look like. So the, the, these are the immune cells, these are the cancer fibroblasts or sort of uh, uh, cells that are in between the cancer cells and the immune cells that all, all have relevance to cancer biology and cancer immunology. We'll also be doing things from uh, uh, blood and plasma, cell-free DNA. We'll also be doing what's called proteomics. So similar to genome sequencing, we can sequence and figure out what proteins are in a particular cell. And then what we call high resolution cellular imaging. So it's really looking at beyond just the light microscope, really looking at cell-cell interactions that we think are very important to treatment response and resistance. So big picture, we're gonna really be taking uh, what's available in 2022 as the most cutting edge techniques that Dr. Ding, again, a world leader in cancer genomics can apply to these precious uh, specimens to really better understand cholangiocarcinoma at these levels. And this is just shown uh, again, the complexity of some of these pipelines where then you can get all this data, terabytes and terabytes, hard drives and hard drives of data, but we have a very sophisticated plan for data integration of how we put that all into reports, both reports that we understand as scientists, but also as reports that can then be passed along to patients of, hey, what did we learn? How can, how can, this, in, how, how can this affect your care right now if we find something? But also importantly is maintaining a, an infrastructure where we say, here are the thousands of mutations or thousands of changes that we see in these cancers, most of which may not be relevant in 2022, but if some really smart person in 2023 or 2024 figures out that this one gene or protein is now of interest, having a way that we can automatically then flag those uh, participants that had that change and return those results in an, ex in an expedited fashion if we think it might impact uh, 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 one's care. Uh, again, a, a very informatics heavy approach, but uh, we, we have all of that uh, developed or in development. In addition to the work with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation through the work that uh, Melinda and Stacy and others have done with both Citizen Health and Komodo Health, we hope to leverage some of those relationships as well so that all of this data that we do on the science side can be integrated with the clinical and sort of healthcare uh, health system level data as well. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll close with just a couple slides that really just reiterate that this is not something that we can do in isolation in our little box in St. Louis. This has to be expanded nationwide and with the partnership of, of Calandro Carcinoma Foundation and, and other patient advocacy groups to do work like this. This is sort of really a, a schematic or a figure of, of how this will actually work. Uh, so if we start in the, in the upper left, we would identify and recruit patients with the partnership of the Calandro Carcinoma Foundation. That may be us reaching out or patients reaching out to us. And I'll explain how that will happen. Uh, we would uh, then enroll patients and they would undergo surveys, uh, database population, participant uh, would be reviewed for their medical records where we decide what samples we need, what sequencing we're going to be able to do. We then have a plan for return of results. Uh, as we're doing that sequencing, we then actually return the results through a number of methodologies, whether that's by mail, whether that's electronic, whether that's video-based. We're trying a lot of different methods to see what might work and what might work better for certain patients and, and patient populations, for example, rural versus urban or older versus younger, who may uh, uh, gain more benefit, uh, appreciate or be able to do certain ones and not others. And then we're gonna uh, evaluate this. And that in, 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 in involves evaluating both the engagement, the return of results, the different projects. Part of that evaluation will be done by um, uh, patient advocates uh, who are part of our review process by people like uh, Melinda and others who are part of the uh, Calandra Carcinoma Foundation and the other advocacy groups who will sit uh, on these calls, who will uh, help us evaluate things, who will uh, be voting members, if you will, of the review process. And then we wanna re re refine it. Again, it'll be very cyclical. So as we identify areas that we're doing well or doing not so well that we need to change, it will be then iterative. So then we can change things and then again, reevaluate how we're doing to try to develop these best practices. This is uh, uh, my contact information in terms of my office and cell phone and email um, um, for uh, further follow-up or questions. But really what I wanna uh, advocate is that this is the best way for patients, 
caregivers or really anyone to learn more about this project. Um, uh, we're basically launching this uh, about a week from now in terms of uh, we've had the time to now get all the infrastructure set to be ready for uh, uh, patients and participants to come in. This email down here is the best way to get more information and, and potentially uh, uh, enroll if someone was interested. Uh, the phone number and website as well. Uh, there, we have a, a, a full-time clinical nurse named Danielle and a research coordinator named Hassani, who will both be uh, kind of the boots on the grounds of answering these emails and then uh, beginning the process of enrolling patients. What I'll really uh, emphasize is this study does not involve uh, physical visits of coming to St. Louis. It's not necessary. It doesn't involve new biopsies or new surgical procedures. We work with the tissues that you've had um, um, acquired previously that are in a pathology lab somewhere, and we work at, uh, at, at without any cost to the patients or participants uh, to accrue those. We, of course, need permission, and, and part of that permission involves consent and, and, and partnership and help with some of the surveys and phone calls and, and that sort of thing, but no, no new biopsies or, or anything like that. Um, we're super excited about uh, the prospects of this really making a, a, a dent in the field uh, of, of really improving the participation in, in, in genomic studies of patients with cholangiocarcinoma uh, that will allow us to learn a heck of a lot more about this cancer at a very, very detailed level. Um, so I'm going to stop there, um, and I think we'll open it up to questions and, and a, a, a dialogue. So I'll stop. Uh, maybe I'll uh, stop sharing my screen, um, and we can. Um, yeah. Uh, see what shows up in the chat. Yes, if you can stop sharing, that would be good. You're still sharing, uh, Dr. Fields. Oh. There we go. Perfect. Um, okay, so we had a few questions come in. Uh, my husband has had multiple liver resections, each time a different mutation. If we provided this info, could we then resubmit subsequent tumor samples for a renewed study? So no, oh, that's a great that's a great question. So we look at each individual patient or participant as say one case, but within that case, there might be one biopsy or one surgery, or there might be multiple biopsies and multiple surgeries. And we would really, that's part of the review process where we would say, hey, we, we think that in this case, we could learn a lot about treatment response and resistance because this patient has had multiple biopsies uh, with multiple treatments in between. So I think, um, uh, Constance, if I'm looking right, that was your question. I think we'd be able to say enroll a patient and say, we're going to try to get all of that tissue to study. Um, and it, so it wouldn't have to be, you wouldn't have to be in the study multiple times, but if you participated or your husband participated in that study, we would be able to study all of those tumors. I'll say at the outset, it may not be the sort of thing where we learn something and we can come back to you and say, this taught us something that we think this is the next best treatment for you in particular. We might. But I think the real goal for us um, and, and the project is, could we learn something about these tumors over time that says, hey, you know what, this, this, the, uh, this resistance uh, to this type of therapy could be explained by this. And so that leads us to a new avenue in cholangiocarcinoma progress and research. Okay. Um, Jim wants to know, can someone who has been through resection and is currently cancer-free participate in this to be proactive? Yeah, it's not the sort of thing that um, um, you need to have active cancer. Um, it could be any time in, your, in the treatment. So it could be somebody who says, listen, I've been cancer free for 10 years, and I hope there's many, many of those types of patients. Of course, that's our goal. And we can go back and, and pull from the, the, the previous surgeries or previous biopsies. It could also be someone who's just uh, was newly diagnosed where we can work to uh, obtain biopsies as they're happening. But again, it wouldn't be us asking or looking for additional uh, new biopsies outside of what your treating uh, 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 treatment team is recommending and wanting and needing. Okay, Fred wants to know what were the outcome benefits of moonshot number one for cancer patients, if you know. Um, so the, the moonshot, um, it wasn't that there was one cancer moonshot or two cancer moonshots. It was, but uh, it's been extended uh, and new priority areas announced. Um, so there have been a number of areas of the cancer moonshot that I would say, hey, here's like the best success story. Uh, one example would be in a particular pediatric uh, lymphoma or leukemia where uh, a new therapeutic was discovered uh, as a result of the moonshot. Um, 
There have been other pro, uh, programs, for example, another program that Dr. Ding and I participate in that's different from the PECGS program. One of the other uh, initiatives was called the HTAN or Human Tumor Atlas Network. And the idea was, could we create these very detailed tumor atlases of cancer types across time where we uh, uh, are able to obtain specimens either from blood or from tumors across the treatment spectrum, sort of like we were talking about a couple minutes ago, and then study those to identify new therapeutic options. And so in pancreas cancer, we just had a, a big paper or study come out that we hope will, has identified a new therapeutic vulnerability, a new target in pancreas cancer. So those, I'd say, are some of the biggest success stories of the moonshot so far. Um, uh, but there are many examples that you can find some of the publications and studies on the Cancer Moonshot website that have uh, been a, a, a success story. Okay, next question. Is this only for U.S. patients? Um, it is only for uh, patients that are being actively treated in the U.S. right now. Um, what we may end up doing if there's a lot of interest outside of the U.S., especially still in North America, uh, we may try to open it up to some other centers. It's a bit uh, challenging to do that uh, for a, an NCI-funded project. It's not impossible, but uh, we wanted to start out within the U.S. and see how it would expand. Okay. And then are tests such as Tempest accessible to your program? Can you clarify? Not yeah. So, so um, there's a number of different, um, obviously, uh, uh, groups out there, companies that do um, genetic testing of tumors for standard of care. So Tempest is one. Uh, Foundation One is another. Keras is another. Most patients with cholangiocarcinoma, in no small part because of uh, the cholangiocarcinoma foundation's work on the Mutations Matters campaign, will have already had standard genomic sequencing like Tempest done. We, we would integrate that into our work. Uh, typical genomic sequencing like for Tempest is looking at what I would sort of say is a high level view of the mutational profile. Let's say that uh, that's at a level comparable to um, a 30,000 foot view on an airplane. We're going to be going down deeper, deeper, deeper into the weeds with all of the research sequencing that we can do on the single cell level on the science side that will complement that. All right. Um, George wants to know, you show a large range of information you will gather from the patients. What about the gut microbiome? There is evidence oh, that so, uh, but surprisingly, the gut bacteria can have substantial effect on patient survival. Fantastic question. Very cutting edge. One of the cool things about this program is this is a, a, a about a, a five to $10 million sort of grant when you sort of factor in a number of the other participating centers. And what the NCI said is you have to set aside a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for each program to do pilot studies. And so one of the studies that's going to be launched through this network is a gut microbiome study that really looks at and deeply integrates the status of a patient's gut microbiome in these different tumor types, including cholangiocarcinoma, um, for a subset of patients where we would then be able to understand those effects. So as you can imagine, although a lot of patients over the course of their treatment may have had their tumors uh, banked and, and sequenced, um, such as um, um, uh, I think Jim, who had mentioned, you know, could we take a, a somebody who's uh, had a previous surgery they probably didn't at the same time sample your gut micro microbiome with a stool sample that's sitting in a freezer somewhere. So that's going to take a group of patients that are, are newly diagnosed or, or on treatment where we can say, if we send you a kit, will you send us not only can we get your, your tumor samples, but would you be able to send us a stool sample? Not something we love to talk about at the dinner table, but these kits are pretty easy to use. And, and we've had really good success with patients providing samples and we think that that's going to be a really exciting area to try to better understand, is there a strong effect on the gut microbiome for response to different types of treatments? Great, great question and something we're super excited about. And I just want to let Jim uh, know that, yes, we will be uh, partnering with Citizen and, the, and our patients who are enrolled. Yes. Okay. Um, Andrew, this sounds like a high integrity, high resolution database. Will it be freely available to all researchers and public access globally. 100%. So, you know, a mandate of the NCI and the Cancer Moonshot program is any data that you generate from this becomes part of the public domain. Even before it's published, you have to agree to that, that it occurs in a timely fashion, meaning we're not sitting on that data um, so that other people can't see it. So we have some competitive edge for something. Um, and, and all of the raw data, so we publish a paper, but all the raw data 
behind that gets deposited to a, a, a database where it's freely accessible and queryable for patients and researchers around the world. Um, and, and anything we publish um, is what we call open access, meaning once it's published in whatever journal it is, um, anybody can click on it. You don't have to pay for the article. Awesome. Um, okay, so Mary Beth, I've been asked to participate in the moonshot in Pittsburgh. It requires blood tests also. What would be the best study to participate? Can she do both? Definitely do both. Um, there's no, uh, no reason that pe pe people and participants in our study can't be on other studies, can't be on a clinical trial um, because we're not asking to do anything different. Um, we will, most of our, um, for patients that are not from uh, in the St. Louis area, we will get, um, at, send a kit to your house that would involve a cheek swab to obtain some of your normal DNA that we can compare to a tumor. There might be some subgroups and pilot tests where we ask and, and arrange for a, a, a lab to come by your house for a blood draw for patients that are willing and able to participate, uh, just like the stool samples for patients that may be participating in some of these smaller projects. Um, but there's not, um, it, it doesn't require a blood draw for all patients. Okay. And what is the expected turnaround time for results? Um, probably a, a little bit of that depends because um, it, uh, it, it becomes less expensive to do the work when you analyze a large number of patients at the same time. So we'll probably be doing the actual work in batches of about 10 to 20 patients. So it may be that somebody who, let's say, comes in initially and is patient number one on that batch versus patient number 20, the, the amount of time may vary, but typically the results will probably be coming back to participants on the order of four to eight weeks. Okay. That's so, also so, something that we're going to be measuring and trying to understand if we can improve on that and does that time frame make a difference to patients? Do they have a perceived benefit or is it helpful for them to receive things more quickly, less quickly in, in batches if uh, certain results come back quicker? Is it better to wait and, and have a discussion or a return of results that shows everything versus piecemeal? Okay. Um, so do you have to have tissue or would a blood biopsy be enough? We're always going to want uh, tissue um, because we need to compare the blood results to that and to be able to do some of the extensive tumor related work we're going to want to look in the tumor directly. But again, that can be a biopsy that, that uh, if, if we know where and when the biopsies were done, our infrastructure does the legwork to then request those and get them to us for analysis. So on the return of results to a patient, what would a report, um, what, what is the results that are going to be covered in the report that's returned to patients? Sure. There'll be uh, several reports that cover what we would call sort of tier one or actionable results, meaning, hey, this is a, a, a genetic um, change in your tumor, let's say a, 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 an IDH1 mutation that we know has a, a drug that we could target right now that would be clinically meaningful. Um, then there's sort of tier two and tier three. Tier two are, hey, there's a mutation here. We don't know if it's clinically relevant, but it could be. And then there's tier three results that are pure research. Um, we have the ability to return all of those results to participants and, and patients. And we would do it uh, in, in, a different, in, in, in different fashions and try to understand, number one, what do patients want to know about? And number two, how do they want to get that information? And then what is their perceived benefit, if any, from receiving that information. And then, Dr. Fields, I just want you to explain a little bit. Our patients are used to getting the genomic results, but we're also going to have the opportunity to receive genetic results, correct? Yes. I, I mean, so uh, there would be results about your genetics in general, anything that we found non-related to cancer that we might find from doing this work, also related to the tumor, of course. Um, and then outside of what we're looking at in just what you call the genetic results are, are at the uh, transcriptomic or the RNA level, a different uh, molecule, and the epigenome, which is sort of regulates how the genome is, is interpreted in, in each cell of our body. There'll be a lot of these different results. Again, some very research focused, but we want to provide these reports and this forum, this dialogue back to participants in a way that they have some meaningful understanding of whether that's meaningful understanding of, hey, here's what, here's what these scientists are doing and what they're learning and what they hope is the next best thing in cholangiocarcinoma, or, hey, if you do find something directly relevant to my case, to my cancer, how can you get those results back to me? 
And I also want to emphasize that every patient who participates, every participant will have the opportunity to decide what results they want back or if they want the, any information back. Yes, we've had some focus group and, and patients that have said, listen, I, I'd, I'd love to contribute to this. This sounds fantastic, but I don't want to know anything about, like, I don't need the results back to me. I just want to, this to go, uh, my tumor to be looked at if it's going to help someone down the road. Um, you don't have to tell me about the research. Then you've got people who are just really interested and really want to know more about what we're doing. And, and part of that is because they want to learn more and be able to spread the word and be on the cutting edge, whether that's of pure interest or uh, to help with their case. There's just a lot of reasons that, number one, we want to know and understand. And that's why we want to partner with patients and patient advocacy groups. Okay. Could we submit biome results of the patient's microbiome? Yeah. So any, yeah, any, 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 um, commercial uh, results that are either in the microbiome or that are be, have been done in, um, in the cancer genomics like Tempus, we would want to try to get all that data. So you could imagine if you were patient Smith and you were going to participate in this during your uh, interview or questionnaire with Danielle or Hassani, where they say, where have you been treated? What, what, what are some of the, who are your doctors? What test results do you know you've had done? And somebody mentioned something like Tempest or Viome. We will get all that data in here, of course, with permission to be able to integrate that with what we're going to do. Okay. Julie says, do they have a limited number of patients they can take in this trial? If possible, can you share the name of the hospital in Canada? They might ask to join. Just want to get in touch with the right center, start having the conversation. Yeah, if we open it up uh, beyond the U.S., it wouldn't really matter where you were. In, in Canada or another, uh, another location. It would just be sort of saying, okay, we're gonna make this an international study. We'll do everything we have to do with the NCI um, to make sure that we uh, dot all our I's and cross all our T's. But after that, it would be very similar where things are being sent to us. Um, and, uh, and just like in the US, we would absorb and pay for a part of the grant, the shipping costs and things like that. It's just an extra layer of what I would say is more logistics and administrative when we cross international borders. Okay. And Marissa, again, are you also taking liquid biopsies or just solid tumor specimens? You can touch on that again. And then what other demographic information do you need? Yeah. So the liquid biopsies for patients that are willing, uh, we would love to, let's say you live in San Francisco, to have a, a, a lab group that would come to the house and, and do a blood draw for, for um, liquid biopsy specimens. We don't anticipate that we'd be able to do that for everyone um, um, or that everyone would want to do that. We will also have a group here in St. Louis, um, say that are patients that are undergoing surgery where we'll be able to get blood as part of standard of care. Um, so we would certainly uh, love participation of patients who are willing to do that. And then the demographic information that will be collected will be pretty uh, extensive. Everything from um, um, the, the easy stuff like male, female, uh, uh, age, and, and uh, uh, ethnicity, things like that but we'll also be looking at rural versus urban. We'll be looking at doing certain dietary and health questionnaires, but really just trying to get uh, as deep a dive into the demographics and what we call kind of metadata of, of what's in, uh, what, what are the participants and what are the patients like uh, across the spectrum of, of their lifestyle, their environment, their background, family history, things like that. Okay, well, before we go, Dr. Fizzle, um, if you could share that slide about how to register again, and then we will be having the information on the um, Clangio Carcinoma Foundation's webpage, and we'll get that information out to you too when ready. Um, yeah. And then so here's, uh, this is the, the best way for somebody who's interested or who wants to um, uh, 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 sort of get, get more information and also consider registering is shoot an email to that PECGS at wustel.edu or give us a phone call at 314-273-2434. Um, there'll be, it's sort of set up to be a, a voicemail and then you get a call back from either Danielle or Hassani to get the ball rolling. Okay. And, and, and then, I'll tell you, there may be, you may, you may learn a little more about it from them and say, this ain't for me and that's fine too. Uh, what we really want to do is then uh, understand why people participate, why they don't, and how we can uh, uh, really make a dent here. How optimistic are you about this research actually making a difference to clangiocarcinoma patients' prognosis? So one of the, uh, so very optimistic. Um, I will couch this by saying I'm, I'm uh, uh, 
exceptionally optimistic about this study, and I'm exceptionally optimistic about some of the tools that have come online in the past couple of years to, to probe into the biology and immunology of tumors at a totally unprecedented way. So what happened back uh, with the genome revolution and being able to sequence tumors, now we can do that at such a higher resolution with imaging um, that, that our ability to really understand why some tumors respond to treatment and don't, especially immune therapy, is the next frontier. One of the things that's hard in certain cancer types that are rare, like cholangiocarcinoma, is if we do that in one or two patients, is, it just because, is that something that's very unique to those patients or are we able to see a trend? Well, if we're able to study hundreds of patients with cholangiocarcinoma using these techniques and, and with the participation of a broad uh, representation of, of cholangiocarcinoma patients, we will undoubtedly figure out some very important things about cholangiocarcinoma that I think will be very relevant to treatment, um, that will better select patients for the right treatments at the right times to maximize the ability of that treatment to work and minimize the times that we're putting patients on a therapy that just isn't going to work for them, um, which obviously exposes you to all the risks and no clear benefits. So I'm very optimistic that this type of research that spans uh, large groups and large teams of investigators is the way of the future to make a, a, a dent in, in cancer biology and cancer immunology. And Constance has a very important question. You say the study data will be publicly available. Will it be de-identified? Yes, 100%. Um, so there would uh, not be anything that would be tied to any of this um, that would be able to go back and, and uh, identify a patient after the fact. Now we will we we have what it's called an honest broker system where we have uh, at WashU behind multiple layers of protection someone who has the key. And the reason for that is again if if we if we do all this work in 2022 and we find out in 2024 that a new mutation makes a big difference in cholangiocarcinoma. We want to make sure that if the patients wanted, we can get that data back to you um, quickly to say, hey, you know, you participated in this and we found that this gene is now relevant and, and you'd be eligible for this treatment. Okay. How much tissue do they need? What, what are you looking for size-wise? We can do a lot off a very small biopsy. So this could be a needle biopsy that was done. This could be a surgical specimen, resection specimen that was done. It may be that when we're doing the review of what samples are available, that if someone had a big tumor in their liver that was removed, we may be able to do some things where we obtain multiple biopsies from that specimen that's in, in pathology to be able to answer some things about this idea of heterogeneity. That may be different from someone that's had a small biopsy, a needle biopsy of, say, a lymph node or something in the lung or anywhere else that we do very different studies. But we would not necessarily be limited on first pass at, uh, at uh, amounts just because we can do so much with such small tissues these days. Um, and Fred, it looks like he, he reached out back in February, probably after the conference. Yeah, yep. So, so you, more than likely, they'll be reaching out to him next week when it's yep, Fred, Fred, I actually, you are on our, our list of, of, uh, of people who have reached out, which there are many. Um, it's taken us uh, uh, really about nine months logistically through hiring people and some of the COVID challenges, but also all this infrastructure to sort of get everything ready to, for our launch date that's going to be next week. So that was one of the reasons for the timing of this webinar, and, and you'll see some announcements coming online over the next couple of weeks as we're really um, getting it uh, off the ground and hope to hit, hit the ground running. All right. Fred says, thanks. Um, last call for questions, last minute questions. Go ahead and throw them in the chat if you have any. Um, and then... If you need the contact information, you can reach out to um, the foundation or to me at melinda at calendricarcinoma.org or advocacy at curecca.org. And I'm happy to get that contact information to you. And then um, soon we'll be having all that information on the website for you as well. Anything else, Dr. Fields, that you wanna say before we go? Just a huge amount of thanks. Um, this is uh, thanks to, of course, Melinda, Stacy, the Clangia Carcinoma Foundation for being our partners in this. It just wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do this without it. And to all the um, patients and their caregivers and their advocates for uh, being willing to uh, uh, potentially help us and, and learn something and be true partners in this. This is, uh, I, I think we've seen over the past, you know, several years, a, a new way that the, uh, the world looks at, at, at uh, a lot of things, importantly research, and that 
the people who participate in research are integral to making that research meaningful and impactful and making it so that it, it, it has the most benefit. So we look forward to partnership and participation uh, uh, of many of you and of the, our continued partnership with the foundation. Okay, we did have another question. And while I'm reading uh, that, we share that contact slide one more time. They wanted it one more time. Yes, definitely. Let me okay. share screen. Well, there we go. Will NGS analysis be done regularly during treatment? For example, would you catch an IDH1 mutant patient who develops an IDH2 mutation? Will you catch FGFR2 uh, mutation changes, resistance? Yeah, kind of like I think what was asked by one of the early questions is if we have access to multiple uh, biopsies over the a patient's treatment course, we would really love to look at, uh, at those in that way to say, hey, what's changing over time and with treatments intervening if those biopsies are available. Um, and so uh, uh, as the intake happens, if we have a patient that goes on to some of these treatments and then has another biopsy, we'd love to try to get our hands on, on all of those for just that type of analysis. Okay, so would this be something if someone signs up that they would stay in contact with you and say, hey, I had another biopsy, do you need a sample or just keep that in the back of their mind? Yeah, uh, we would have pretty regular follow-up and we're, we'll be creating a patient portal, a way for the patients to interface with us where they can see their results, they can communicate with us almost like a, 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 a chat in their standard medical record, but this would be sort of a, a, a within the research database. And so it would be a way to say, hey, I'm gonna have another biopsy, um, um, we can uh, uh, then request that or, hey, I had a, 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 a read one of my reports and I had a question. So really a good way to seamlessly interface with us. Okay. And just to reiterate, there is no cost to the patient. Correct. Um, if you're already having a biopsy, they're just going to use the tissue that's already there and available. Um, and anything and that we request, like these cheek swabs or something would be mailed to you with a prepaid mailer to send back to us and, and easy instructions and phone numbers to call and ways to do a, a quick FaceTime or a Zoom if you needed help with something. So we're really gonna try to address a lot of the things that have been brought up by patients and patient advocates about how we can make this not only meaningful and impactful, but, but, but easy. Okay, and I just wanna reiterate, there wouldn't be frequent repeat biopsies. It would only be if you were doing them um, in your standard of care treatment. Correct. Like if, if, if let's say a, a patient participated and, and, and had had surgery two years ago, uh, we would get that specimen. And let's say then they were going in for a biopsy, you know, a month later, um, we would try to get access to that if we could, but we wouldn't ask a patient to have an additional biopsy uh, uh, or an additional procedure. Okay, I think that was it. Those last few questions that came in. I want to thank everyone for the wonderful questions. You guys always come up with great questions. We got a lot covered there. That's fantastic. Thank you, um, Dr. Fields, for explaining it all to us. We look forward to the launch next week and for getting um, carcinoma patients signed up. We'll get that information out to you and feel free to reach out to myself or Dr. Fields for more information. Everyone have a wonderful day and thank you. Thank you so much.